Hello and welcome to episode 24 of series 2 of the Engaging Internal Comms podcast. This is the show for employee engagers and internal communicators who like to keep up to date with all that is new in our profession. My name's Craig Smith from The Big Picture People. Uh, just like to say thank you to everyone who's been sending us messages about how much you're enjoying the show and how much you are getting from it, which is really appreciated. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to Engaging Our Internal Comms via your podcast platform of choice. It helps to improve our visibility and it means that, again, we can attract more and more listeners and contributors to our community. Uh, and if you want to share the episodes that you're listening to with any of your network, your colleagues, it would be much appreciated. And then we can accelerate the growth of listeners and again increase the number of contributors that we have to our community. Um, I just want to make you aware of an event that we are running uh, very soon in the near future uh, on the 9th of September 2021. That's uh, at three o'clock in the afternoon. It's a free webinar. If it's for anyone who is involved or has colleagues who might be involved in, in to try and tra transform the way that you communicate and train health and safety issues within your organisation, we found that our, our own particular methodology at the Big Picture People works really well in helping organisations to transform the way they talk about this subject and we're running a webinar to really explore some of the challenges that are associated with traditional ways of, of, of communicating health and safety issues and I think again this, this is particularly relevant at the moment but because it, it's not just traditional health and safety slips, trips and falls it, it also includes things like uh, mental health and well-being which, which I think again is, is a lot of, a lot of organisations have on their priorities at the moment. So if you'd like to book up for that webinar, it's totally free. If you go to our website, which is thebigpicturepeople.co.uk, and at the top of the screen, you will see our events, or you'll see our menu, and on there you'll see events. And the first event that you'll see listed is Transforming Health and Safety Communication and Training. And you can book up there. Uh, and it's a Zoom webinar, so you can there's a link to the Zoom webinar there that, where you can sign up. Um, if that's not re necessarily relevant to you, but you know any colleagues who might be interested in that, then please send them the link or, or make them aware of it, and so they can uh, dig it out for themselves. Um, next episode coming up in a couple of weeks, I've got an interview with uh, Niall Ryan from the Department of Health and Social Care, who's going to be telling us all about organisational purpose and remote working. He's going to be telling us all about how they've onboarded a lots of new people at his organisation, um, but also have had to onboard them into a remote working environment. So he's going to be telling us all about how he's helped to connect them to what the organisation is trying to achieve. And that's quite interesting because that organisation has been not only affected by the pandemic, but has also been responsible for many of the communications in the United Kingdom that have gone out about the pandemic. So they've kind of, it's a very, very kind of uh, interesting situation that they found themselves in. And then coming up after after that, the episode on the 29th of September is an interview with uh, Andrea Scarpula from DHL America, and she's got, going to be telling us all about how you can measure the impact of internal comms. A perennial question that internal communicators are always uh, interested in, I think, is how do we prove our worth? How do we measure the return on investment that we're asking our organizations to make in internal communications? And this is a, a topic that Andrea has been very passionate about for her career in internal communications. Uh, a very large organization, DHL America, as you can imagine, and she's going to be telling us all about the tools and techniques that she's used within her organization to help to measure internal communications. So I think that's enough of me. So we'll now move on to this episode's guest interview. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that many people who work in internal communications and employee engagement probably never set out at the beginning of their career to work in that area. I think many people who I speak to who work in those professions have migrated there through either through uh, PR, through journalism, through marketing routes or through HR or L&D roles. Um, so the professionalization of internal communications is something that I know that the, the industry is, is very keen to achieve. And as part of that, the earning of a trusted advisor status to earn that place at the table so we are not just seen as a pair of hands, that we are seen as 
uh, a team or as individuals or as professionals who can add strategic value to the organization as true business partners is something that I think everyone has invested interest in. And I think during the pandemic of the recent of 2020 and 2021, there has been certainly a raised profile of internal communications as a profession as a valued partner in the organization. And I hope that we will be able to maintain that going forward. So what I wanted to do was explore with a practitioner, someone who's been working in an organization throughout the pandemic, but also over over a long period before that as a professional in internal communications to find out what is it that metaphorically I see and employee engagement needs to do to earn that place at the table, to be seen as a trusted advisor, to be seen as someone who is strategically driving the business forward and able to add value beyond just crisis management, which uh, which is obviously something that's been t- at the fore recently. So that's what today's interview is all about. How does I see earn that valuable place at the table and also retain it, of course? With more than a decade of internal communication experience in the engineering and technology organisation Siemens, Lisa Gwinnell has a natural passion and aptitude for enabling people to thrive in their roles in complex organisations. Lisa has achieved this through aligned, creative and authentic internal communication strategies and interventions. Lisa recently achieved a master's in internal communication management and her commitment to the ongoing professional development. Lisa is also a certified member of the Institute of Internal Communications. Hello, Lisa. How are you? Hi, Craig. Yeah, I'm great. Thank you for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure. And just for the listeners, whereabouts in the world are you at the moment? I am in Sunny Pool in Dorset on the south coast of the UK. In the UK. And is it sunny today? It is actually for the moment. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. So um, Siemens is an organisation that I'm sure many people, if not everybody who is listening to this should should have heard of. But tell us a little bit more, more about Siemens and also tell us a little bit more about your role there at the moment, please. Lisa. Yeah, sure. yeah, I just say Siemens is, has been around a long time um, in many different guises and, and many people may remember it for mobile phones many years ago. We don't do that anymore. But um, uh, yeah, we've got about 200 160,000 people globally um, in Siemens in many different countries around the world and it's a major Czech technology player and um, the part that I work for is called Siemens Mobility Uh, so that's the transport part of uh, the organisation and um, it's mainly to do with anything that's road related, rail related um, so, yeah, anything to do with transport technology um, on the railway and, and, and traffic, really. Um, the chances are that you'll interact with some of our systems every day, wherever you are, you know, whether you're crossing the road or using your car or going out on public transport. So, you know, we're pretty much everywhere, really. Um, we've got 30,000 employees globally in Siemens Mobility and four and a half of four and a half thousand of those are in the UK. So that's the part that I'm responsible for. And have been for a number of years. I've been in Siemens 14 years, so um, and just about to move on. Um, but it's a, an organisation that I I really know and love and mm. very passionate about. So yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, my role specifically internal communications for Siemens Mobility in the UK. So look after everything to do with the strategy and with also the deliverables, so the channels and messaging across our very complex and operational organisation. Wow! Yeah! Wow! That's, 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 thank you. That's uh, and uh, thirty thousand people, and roughly how many countries is that? Are those thirty thousand people spread well, across? Testing my knowledge, pretty much. <laughs> Yeah, so we've got um, eight regions around the world, of which uh, UK and Ireland is is one. And so, yeah. yeah, there's never a dull moment in in Siemens Mobility in terms of, uh, of the the projects that we've got going on. It's really quite exciting. I can well imagine. I can well imagine. Uh, fantastic. Well, anyway, today, today we're talking about a place at the table for internal mm. communications. And, and I think that's a metaphor we, you know, we've, we've probably heard used before. So, uh, and that's how we kind of connected with each other. We, we you know, we would, we, 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 I reached out to you to see if you'd be interested in being an interviewee. And then that was an area that we kind of both thought was a really important topic. So let's, let's just, before we dive into how we get a place, say, well, let's just be really clear what we mean about having a place at the table for IC. What, what what are your what are you what's your interpretation of that term having a place at the table? Yeah, for me, um, 
in my current role and, and hopefully my future role. It means being involved at the right time where decisions are being made mm. um, that will impact employees, either by the changes that are being made at the time or, or decisions being made to continue uh, with the status quo. Um, and that's firstly to understand the context in which those decisions are being made. And, you know, if I look back to the last year, that's really important with COVID. Mm. Um, but very often that context is sometimes missed if it gets passed down the line uh, to you and, you know, saying this was discussed and the outcome is we need an email, which is, um, to be frank, only slightly less demoralising than if a, a poster was demanded. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, the, the context allows you to sort of understand where leaders or whoever the stakeholders are are coming from and, and those um, competing priorities that you're up against and having having that um, view really does help. Um, and it means you can add some value there and then uh, without those decisions being made, without you being present and give a different perspective or voice of the employee or some nuggets of stats or um, it, your experience of how you may want to tackle the situation. And that helps with that trusted advisor building that, you know, we all try and do as IC mm. professionals. I um, mm. mean that those tactics aren't then just jumped jumped and thought about when you're not in the room and, and you then get the, the, the email request or a poster request. Or, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And, and I, I have to say, I felt it, um, it was the last year um, that's probably the most valued I've felt at having a seat at the table as an yeah, yeah. communicator. So it's something that I had put a lot of value on before, but probably now even more so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it, 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 you used the term trusted advisor there. I think there's a multiple, mm-hmm. you know, kind of terms as a business partner. There's that whole, and I think it's that whole thing around being, you know, someone who is not just a pair of hands, which is, you know, as you imply by the kind of, can you do an email? Can you do a poster? Is the kind of pair of hands role? It's it's that strategic, strategic trusted advisor, business partner who, you know, is basically delivering the outcome rather than being told how to deliver you know just to go off and deliver a task isn't it i remember when i i i worked in corporate life i read a book called flawless consulting by peter block i don't know if i've come across it and oh well that's more geared up towards being an external consultant i think those internal consultancy skills are really you know how you become that trusted advisor and i totally i think that's that's kind of essentially what we're talking about isn't it with this sort of having a place to the t- at the table yeah, um definitely. You mentioned the pandemic there, and we are recording this still in the midst of the uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, but we're not letting. You know, so I think it's a useful context to think about what we mean and how I see as as that, that that place at the table. Certainly, uh, certainly, hopefully not temporarily, but certainly, but you, you you know, I think it has come to the fore. Mm. Uh, I mean, what are your perspectives on how? I see has has risen and has has earned that place at the table during the pandemic. I mean, what are your own perspectives and maybe some of your own personal experiences from that uh, from that that uh, the, the whole situation that we've been through? Yeah, I mean, I'm speaking from my own personal experience first, it has it has cemented that internal comms is is intrinsically important to when you have. Um, crisis situations or when you have mega changes in an organization that are either forced upon you from outside uh, forces or, or, or internally driven and um, being someone that can be called upon and, and knows how things work in the organization knows the audiences and the channels to get messages out through the organization I'm not saying I'm I'm, I'm not saying I'm brilliant but um, <laughs> we you know we definitely got a few things right by the feedback that came through um, mm. but from speaking to my colleagues as well I mean it's, it's a real mixed bag um I think some have unfortunately, you know, lost their roles due to being in in organisations and industries that have folded due to the pandemic. But some have risen through the ranks and really been able to show their worth, and and some have got new roles out of it as well. So it's um yeah, it's a real it's a real different set of um uh, of, of mixed bag depending mm. on where you are. I think I've been very fortunate to be in an industry that has has powered through the pandemic and still remained very profitable and successful um, and needing to get people from A to B has, has always been the case. Um, mm, mm. And um, But if I look at reports from uh, you know, the Gallagher State of the Sector report, it's internal communications has, has definitely risen up through the ranks, as you put it, and um, uh, the profession has become um, you know, an, a really important part of yeah. uh, alongside HR and IT, you know, it's it's 
no longer seen, if it was, and I've used this phrase recently as a as the sort of ugly cousin of marketing <laughs> or yeah. uh, external PR, you know, sort of thing. It is seen as as something that is a valid career choice and is a valid um, part of an organization's success, which I've always believed it it is and yeah. um, thankfully Siemens have recognized that too. And and I guess I mean that's for obvious reasons during the pandemic. The fact that people were kind of well, a lot of people anyway, not everybody uh, was was flung out of the office and sent off packing with their, you know, the computers and sort of laptop stands under their arms to go and work from home. So I think that whole whole connectivity piece obviously was a, was a major drive behind that. And then the fact that I'm sure for your organization, you had people for, for whom it was business as usual, almost where they were kind of just carrying on and what's, you know, not what's all the, the, the all the, the drama about, but, but essentially, you, you know, their roles were, were, were still sort of out in the field and, and doing what they needed to do, albeit yeah. with, with some change restrictions on it, obviously. And then the challenge of connecting those yeah. two different audiences and not making either of them feel as, as though they're, they're sort of, um, they cut off so i think that that was an important aspect of it i mean how do you in what other ways do you perceive that 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 place at the table came about and how did it how did it kind of manifest itself so do you, you know was it a case that 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 your senior leadership team kind of realized that 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 was something that w- w- was essential or was it something that you had to try and you know kind of advocate for is it just so through necessity that the fact that, that that you know there was clearly a communication and enhanced communication need perhaps mm-hmm. um- I like to think it was a bit of both. So certainly initially when I was hearing murmurings back to March to 2020 of, you know, crisis meetings, I think actually it was the end of February when we first heard we might be getting some impacts on our sites. And, you know, I did I did muscle my way into a few meetings. Um, <laughs> I did invite myself along. And I think sometimes you need to sort of see those opportunities. Uh, mm. If you get turned down, that's fine. But if you feel you can make a difference, absolutely, you, you need to go for it and and be prepared to add your worth in those meetings and not just sit there and sort of take notes or nod and you know be very polite you need to sort of be be bold and be um, able to sort of have your your strategic hat on and see those opportunities which I did and then became part of the furniture really in daily meetings sometimes Mm. daily meetings with the leadership team who I ordinarily would normally and have gone back to going to present to them when we need decisions on things or you know so very much transactional kind of going in and seeing them when things needed to be discussed rather than being part of the whole discussion um so, you know, that was in crisis times, definitely that bit about context setting. And I was able to see the whites of their eyes, albeit virtually, yeah. as they were going through every day. So, um, you know, I think that initial one, earning your place um, and, and showing that you have some worth and can actually make some quick wins. Um, and then you, you earn the trust and you can, you can, you know, be part of the discussions going forward. So, yeah. 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 And, 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 and I guess, you know, once, once you got the total, you got your elbows out and you got in the room and you, you got around the table and, and then, I, and, and I mean, what, what are some of the things that you've taken? Cause I guess in a crisis, everybody, you know, if, if there's a fire, everybody wants the sort of fire firefighter to come and put the fire out for them. And then after the fire's gone out, they, everybody's kind of thinks about, you know, their, their, their tension drifts elsewhere. And I know we're not kind of in that situation. We're still in the midst of this, but I mean, from your personal experience, I mean, a couple of questions, I guess, is what have you learned from the pandemic that, you, you, you know, in terms of that, getting that place at the table uh, uh, that, that you, you're going to carry forward, but then also how do we, how do you keep that place at the table, I guess, is also the next thing, isn't it? Because um, people's attentions will focus on then rebuilding and, and, and I guess it's reminding people that actually comms is still a part of the rebuilding. It's not just about the putting the fires out in the first place. It, you know, there's a key key role there. I mean, what are your thoughts around that? Both, you know, going forward in terms of what we can learn from this, uh, you know, once we're outside of a crisis situation, but also how do we keep that kind of trusted advisor status uh, for the profession? Yeah, so for me, I've learned a lot about my, my personal style and having to, you mentioned about different audiences and that's going to be so true going forwards, um, never truer really with the mix of organisational setups and working um, environments that people are going to be in. And so being able to flex your 
um, channels and messages towards those different groups and, and probably at an individual level, a very personal level, because mm. I think one of the things I've learned is that everybody's experience through the pandemic and therefore going forwards is very different. Yeah. And the grouping people by whether they're working at home or whether they're having to come into one of our sites every day is fine to a certain extent, you know, that broad brush communications. But when you really need to make a difference to the hearts and minds and having that personal touch rather than uh, a very instructional communication, do this, do that, um, that's when you need to go down to the individual level and, mm. um, you know, everybody's been through so many different facets of over the last year some people have unfortunately lost some people some people have been ill themselves and lots of other different things that make their internal communications needs um much different Mm. and for me therefore i think the role of line managers and being able to engage that population um whatever it means in your organization for me it's it's about 900 odd people which is quite a large proportion Mm. um engaging those and those and 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 really supporting them uh, and not just giving them information that they need to pass on but giving them the tools to be able to work out what the key messages are and then what their audience needs and that may be on a one-to-one level it may be you know in small teams but yeah. allowing them the flexibility to to decipher that message but that they've got all the the tools and the uh the yeah the toolkit and the messaging yeah. to be able to do that and they've got they can use themselves as a peer group and they can um, feedback and get support um, alongside all the other things that we know a manager has to do in their yeah, day. Yeah. Um, but for me, that will be the thing that stands the test of time going forwards. Um, in certainly in Siemens Mobility, I can see that and in the organization I'm joining in the future. Yeah. So it will be, I think, the ability to flex, uh, no one size fits all. And having you know the channels and supporting mechanisms to allow that to happen through your organisation. Definitely, yeah. No, I, it reminds me again of, of, of my corporate career, which is way I, I, I was in one of those. It wasn't internal comms at the time, but it was one of those roles where it was kind of tough sell to a line manager that well, how I'm kind of adding value to you and your your team. And um, and I remember it was it was really going about understanding what their objectives were, and then you know, you know you couldn't do it with it individually for every line manager, but kind of understanding generally what a line manager was trying to achieve and and how your you could help them to deliver that through your role, and and then and then you know that then it's a much easier sell, isn't it? Than than when you go to them with I've got a load more things I need you to do on top of your already like ridiculous workload. Um, uh, you know that they, they kind of don't want to let you in the door in the first place, do they? But if they see you as a as a catalyst for helping them deliver their own objectives, without kind of just becoming a kind of dumping ground for them, I think it can it can changes that relationship, doesn't it? Significantly, yeah, definitely. And you know we're still on that journey. I think. Um, if COVID has done anything, it has exposed some areas of, of organisations, communications uh, that are probably not so uh, watertight. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's no bad thing. It means you, you can learn and improve. And, and we've definitely already started that process um, with some with some help from some very clever people. So mm. it's, um, it's yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a journey, as they say. Mm. Um, and <laughs> yeah. uh, using the Siemens mobility analogy there. Yeah. Um, but, um, it's, yeah, it's it's really quite exciting and I, yeah. I look forward to hearing what the team do in the future. Fantastic. Fantastic. So just just extending that the the, the conversation into into the, into you know outside of um, the pandemic, I, you, you, I said in the in the intro that you you've just completed your masters in in internal communications management, and um, I know that you're involved heavily in the IOIC's push for for professionalising and 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 you know driving the value of IC. Um, you know, and I'm I'm involved in the IOIC, so it'd be really, really nice to sort of explain what what that initiative is about, but also again, it kind of links in with this whole place at the table, the professionalisation and trusted advisor. Tell us a little bit more about that program and and what's involved with that, please. Yeah, so the um, I chose IC campaign with the IOIC is is really something that um, caught me by surprise at how passionate I'd be if I'm being <laughs> completely honest. Um, I am one of those people, hands up, that fell into IC. I, I did a marketing degree. I did a postgrad in marketing. I started Siemens in marketing and then saw this. Um, I think I had an internal newsletter that was part of my remit 
And I saw some brilliant opportunities and just ended up working in IC, I think about six, nine months later. Mm. Um, and I've stayed in that ever since. And But it was never something that was on the syllabus in any of my communications um, degree or postgrad activities. And it it was something that um, just really suited my personality. Mm. And I think as I've gone through um you know, various levels of the organization and try to recruit people into internal communications roles, there is a real big gap at the the entry level positions. Um, and we've got, a, uh, for example, we've got an internal communications um, intern at the moment and have had previous ones. And um, it, it, you have to really sort of explain the basics um, mm. because nobody seems to want to come into internal communications as a career choice. I'm sure there are people, but they haven't crossed my uh, my applications as of yet. <laughs> um, they tend to want to go into HR or, you know, they want to sort of go into marketing. Um, internal communications doesn't seem to be mm. on the list. So when, you know, a mixture of coming out of master's feeling very invigorated um, about internal communications as a profession. I had never really done an, an internal communications course previous to the master's, which I completed in 2019, and mm. finally get to graduate this year, I might add, after um, the pandemic. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, and also, you know, the, the pandemic sort of really showing that internal comms has, has that um, renewed uh, spotlight on it. I really wanted to join up with the IOIC and try and um, help get more people into uh, into into the sort of industry. Mm. Now, working for an engineering company, it's very much drummed into you about uh, the importance of STEM, science, technology, yeah. engineering, and math, and getting um, you know apprentices, graduates, and entry level talent in at a very young age. Uh, you know, often we've done dealt with school children and you know try to inspire them. Um, and yeah, up to, up to university students. So yeah, whilst I can support that, that's not my profession. That's the industry I work in. But I feel I can do something definitely for the equivalent in internal communication. So mm, mm. I fully um, uh, endorse the the sort of um, the campaign that's going on. Me personally, I want to reach out to my local university, Bournemouth, where I went and has a very strong communications faculty and mm. uh, hopefully can make some connections there and and, uh, and bring those forward but yeah any way i can i will be um i'll be lending my name to supporting this um, fantastic fantastic yeah and absolutely i think you're right i mean i i, I think it's a common a common theme that i hear that that, that many people have found their way into in, internal comms and and uh i guess there are other professions as well that that people d- you know don't leave leave school or when they you know and you go to them as children say what do you want to do when you grow up and 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 there's there's a various i think t- roles in in organizations and i think i see potentially is one of them because i think you know i think it's just that that that, that there's there's until you actually get and work in a in a in a reasonable size large organization, it's not a need that you actually perceive that there's, there's a necessity yeah. for, is it? It's only really when you kind of see the kind of if effects of not having effective comms in an organization that you you kind of see the the the, the, the need for it and appreciate that, that it, it, it it's a it's a it's a kind of a a required role and a required function and and, and can add a huge amount of value as we know. Absolutely, yeah. And and so the, the so you mentioned there there's a, there's there's the obviously the professional qualifications side of it there's the advocacy I guess is as part of the the this the the uh, I chose I see I choose I see sort of initiative are there any other aspects that, that that people could be aware of or could could maybe plug into as well uh, outside of you, you know the kind of immediate, immediate IOIC community. I think any opportunity you've got to um, talk about what you do, um, and I've seen lots of threads on LinkedIn about how would you describe your role and what you do mm. in an organisation. It's sort of like an elevator pitch, you know. Mm. How would you describe it? And anything, any sort of myth busting you can do, um, uh, you know, be it even to family or friends about what you do in the organisation. You know, I, I in my early days, I got referred to as the person that sent the emails out. And, you know, that is still true. I do send mm. emails out, but I do a lot more than that now. So, you know, being able to to give a, a better account of yourself, um, don't be shy to put yourself forward for things like this and for, uh, you know, other opportunities. Yeah. To, that's about what you're doing. And, you know, intrinsically, internal communications and 
to some extent, communications people in general don't often shout about what we're we're doing. We're often very much head in, uh, head in the you know the sort of the work in hand and taking a moment just to put your head up and and look around you. Maybe entering for some awards. That's something that's certainly on my mind for the next couple of years is to actually pitch my efforts against others and see how, mm. how I come out really and how the team comes out so yeah. um and that then gives you the opportunity to sort of share and, and and get more um more comment and experience um and out of that naturally so yeah yeah it's it can be difficult to find the time to do extra things um other than your your day job but um I think for the future of our profession and to get more entry level talent into the organizations um, and, and into internal communications um, that then rise up through the ranks and, and can do us proud in the decades to come. Um, yeah. and that, um, you know, that's really important. Fantastic. Fantastic. So just, just as we sort of bring things to a conclusion there, that's been really, really helpful. I mean, just, just I want to just tap into your your significant experience and any, you know, is there anything else we've not talked about that, you know, snippets of wisdom or, or experience that you've got that when we, we, you know, we've talked about professionalization, we've talked about advocacy through the, you know, the IOIC work. We've also talked about some of the lessons from the pandemic. Any, any final thoughts from you in terms of, you know, what it is and what, 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 what anyone who's listening to this, this may be thinking thinking about who's not maybe got that place at the table maybe they're peering around the door at the moment or or they're outside waiting to you know to knocking on the door seeing if they can get in a- any tips to you from you about getting that place at the table and keeping that place at the table that we've not already already covered off in the uh, in the conversation we've had so far hmm, that's put me on the stop spot there but if i think <laughs> about my personal my personal journey over the last couple of years um has been to be a lot more open, um, open to ideas, uh, open uh, to learning. Mm. Um, so it's something we call in Siemens Growth Mindset, and it's, uh, I mean, there's there's lots of books on it, lots of theory on it. But mm. you know that um, realization to me a few years ago that you, you you don't just stick with the same knowledge and that carries you through your whole career. That doesn't work these days. Mm. Um, mm. It's something have to build on almost on a daily basis and with things changing rapidly in industry and with technology and uh, with people and how they live their lives um it's particularly important to internal communicators but i think it's a universal approach and and being able to take some time for yourself to reflect um personally what's important to you and how you approach things and you know whether you need to do a bit of extra uh, learning courses you know or, or e-learning whatever it is that adds a bit more to your a few more strings to your bow yeah and um, for me um particularly with the part about having a seat at the table is is being um open to those uh those those ideas that people bring and the the um not shutting down ideas i think yeah. you know, i've been guilty of Sometimes in the past, using the the old adage of um, we've we've always done it this way, which yeah. makes me cringe a little bit. <laughs> 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 it, but you know, I think um, the the reason why we've been able to move things on as we have, particularly in the last eighteen months, is getting different perspectives in and and being one of those different perspectives um, mm. in that in the, where those decisions are made, but also accepting um, feedback and uh, accepting people into your into your world and asking mm. for feedback is really important. I work as a, you know, I'm pretty much the only person in the internal comms team in Siemens Mobility in the UK. So I have to reach out to, you know, the, the HR community, yeah. the IT community uh, and lots of others for that um, counsel and feedback. And that's done me no world of good in terms of building those relationships and um, and, and my personal growth as well. And I think, um, yeah, growth, having a growth mindset is, is going to be very important fantastic yeah no fantastic that, that that's brilliant and well well thank you for sharing that, that those insights with us and and obviously can, many congratulations i should have said that right at the beginning on your on your uh your your, your master, master's degree and uh and obviously look it's so you say you've not graduated yet you're going to be graduating no, yeah. the yeah. pandemic so october 2020 oh. to graduate so yeah superb oh that'll be that'll be wonderful and uh, a marvelous day and yeah. hopefully you'll be able to celebrate with uh, uh you, you know not just on your own there'll be people there to celebrate with you i'm sure it sounds like that's going to be the case so um that's wonderful so just um 
as you know, I always ask at the end of my interviews, or I've, I've pre-warned you anyway, at the end of the interview, I always, always ask my interviewees something that even people who either work with them uh, or professionally or know them, you know, outside of work, uh, maybe don't know about them. Maybe it's something you did when you were younger or something you do now that, uh, or something you're really passionate about that you're happy to share with us. So um, tell us something that not everybody knows about you, please, Lisa. So we're recording this during the Tokyo Olympics. So uh, I thought I would keep that theme going. And um, no, I'm not an Olympian or a previous Olympian, but uh, 2012 London Olympics, I was in the opening ceremony. As uh, a so yes, that's my claim to fame and probably one of the most memorable, exciting, terrifying experiences Um of my life and yeah so July 27th 2012 will be etched in my memory forevermore and wow. that was a fantastic night so yeah and, and what did you what were you how did what were you where were you where were you in the uh, in the in the show where did, where did you where, where, where were you positioned or what were you doing so um I was in the very opening part which um actually went on for about half an hour before we we went on the TV um, TV camera, so it was the nice green and pleasant land that then got so uh, ripped up by the industrial revolution and, uh, and bring out. So I was in charge of a group of uh, children running around a maypole doing lots of maypole dancing. So um, <laughs> it was uh, yeah, it was a very surreal experience, and I've still got my costume and everything to do with it. But um, yeah, I think it, yeah, it was a very amazing experience. Lots of rehearsals, lots of secrecy. Um, and a few a few dress rehearsals, which I got to have my my parents in the audience, which was amazing. So, oh, amazing! Um, yeah, so it was really really great. And I I like a lot of people was quite skeptical about the London Olympics and um, you know what it would what it would be like. But that sense of community, the amount of volunteers that took part, and from a comms point of view as well, how, watching how that event was pulled together. Yeah. You know, and, uh, are probably not a massive part of our roles these days but we'll come back um the event uh yeah i had one eye on sort of what i was doing but one eye on how how everything was being yeah. pulled together, and it was just awesome so, it was yeah yeah, yeah we were uh, yeah, it's weird thinking it was nine years ago because it's i mean we we went to the we didn't go we went to one of the kind of days at the stadium when the athletics was on which you know was a, just a brilliant experience but as you say i mean the whole even though it wasn't a final or anything like that it was just amazing and, and the coordination and the volunteers and everything was just was, was amazing so yeah it's sort of strange to think it was all those all time ago and it still still seems so vivid but uh mm. Yeah, and I'm obviously more so for you, given the the experience you had. So, well, well, well done, excellent. That sounds amazing. So, um, well done. So, anyway, I will put some. Uh, li- I'll put your, if it's okay with you, I'll put your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. So, um, uh, if anyone would like to reach out to you and find out more about your work with IOIC and also any any questions that they've got about uh, getting their elbows out and getting around the table uh, they'll get okay to get in touch with you I presume that's okay yeah fantastic and that though so just for list, the listener that those show notes are on our website so that's uh, engagingic.com if you go to our our website there with the podcasts are you will find the show notes for this episode there and uh, and you'll be able to read the transcript and also any links that uh, we've put in there um that is absolutely awesome, Lisa. Well, thank you very much. I wish you all the best. Obviously, you mentioned at the beginning this is a sort of a, a transition point in your career. So, wish you all the best for the future. And um, obviously, I hope the graduation goes absolutely fantastically for you and is a wonderful memory, similar to the, your memories of London 2012. Um, and uh, I'd just like to thank you for your time and, and for your generosity and giving your, your, your wisdom there to our listeners. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, Craig. Take care. Brilliant. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. So thank you very much for listening to Engaging Internal Comms. We hope you found this episode useful and interesting. We'd uh, love to get your thoughts about the show and any questions you have or ideas for topics that you'd like to maybe cover in future episodes. You can email us at info at thebigpicturepeople.co.uk or you can get in touch with us via the contact form 
at engagingic.com. You can also sign up for our mailing list there and we'll send you relevant news about the show, future episodes, and we'll also let you know about anything interesting we found out about internal communications and employee engagement. Uh, If you like the show and you haven't already done so, please subscribe to it via your podcast service. And you can also subscribe via the links on our podcast page, which again is engagingic.com. If you like the show, we'd be really grateful if you could leave us a review. And if you know anyone else who might be interested in the show who might benefit from it, please let them know. Please share it with them and share them the uh, with them the links to the show and engagingic.com. Thank you very much. Thank you.